Well, if you have your Bible, why don't you turn with me to Mark chapter 3, verses 7 to 35. This is actually going to be our our last week in the Gospel of Mark for a little while. We're going to jump into some Christmas texts next week, and then in the new year we're going to be somewhere else. But Mark chapter 3, uh, verses 7 to 35. And it's not quite a Christmas text by any stretch, but there is a bit of a connection, I think, to Christmas, and we'll talk about that uh, presently here. Uh, but as you've noticed, of course, uh, Mark and the team did a lovely job decorating the stage, and it is beginning to look a lot like Christmas, as the song says. And you've probably noticed this as you've been driving around town. You'll see more lights up in the, in the, on, the, on the houses, and some people have nice decorations on their lawn. You go to stores, and and stores are selling all the Christmas stuff, and on TV there's Christmas features. Everything is about Christmas right now. And it's interesting, in our society, Christmas is the one holiday that we just do so much more for than any other holiday, right? If you look at how much you spend on Christmas compared to how much you spend on maybe Halloween or some of these other holidays, it, it probably doesn't even come close. We've just kind of really embraced Christmas and all the traditions that go along with it. You know, so probably for a lot of us now, we've, we've got the tree, we've maybe cut down a fresh one, or we've got a, a fake one that we pulled out of the basement, we've decorated the tree, we've put up the lights. Uh, some of us have put lights on the outside of our house, or maybe you've just plugged in the lights that have been there all year on the outside of your house. Uh, we've done things like hung stockings over the Christmas tree, or over the fireplace. We've decorated with little things around the house. We've gone Christmas shopping. We've written Christmas cards. Maybe we've taken a family photo. Right? We're, we're planning to have, maybe once all these restrictions end, we're planning to have family over for a nice feast. We're going to do some puzzles, watch Hallmark movies, drink hot chocolate, go play in the snow. All the things that we love to do at Christmas. Now, as you might have noticed, or maybe you didn't notice, all the things that I just mentioned had nothing to do with Jesus. And I I kind of did it this way just to remind us that it's easy for us to get caught up in all the things related to Christmas, but miss the fact that it's actually about Jesus and what he did for us on that first Christmas. I think it's really easy, especially for Christians, to kind of take for granted the fact that, yeah, of course Christmas is about Jesus, but then spend most of our time and get most excited about the things that aren't actually right at the heart of what Christmas is all about. Something for us to keep in mind. And yet, there's another dynamic that we see taking place at Christmas, and it's this. Christmas, I think, for most people, for your average person, is the time of year that you hear the most about Jesus. You've probably noticed this, that in places that you would never expect Jesus to be mentioned, we hear about Jesus at Christmas. So you'll be driving in your truck and you turn on the radio to a secular radio station and all of a sudden you're hearing Christmas carols that mention the name of Jesus. You'll you'll hear on secular radio these songs that talk about Jesus being born in Bethlehem. It's, It's quite interesting. You turn on your TV, you watch a Christmas movie, and in the Christmas movie sometimes you'll hear them talking about the real meaning of Christmas. Uh, Years ago, there was that famous Charlie Brown Christmas special where at the end of the Christmas special, Linus read from the Gospel of Luke the Christmas story. He said, Charlie Brown, this is the real meaning of Christmas. And, And every year that story is played on TV, that show is played on TV for millions of people to hear the Gospel being read. You even had a couple years ago, they made an animated feature film about the donkey that that brought Mary to Bethlehem. And so you have these Hollywood studios with all these famous actors making a movie about the first Christmas and about Jesus. And then you walk into stores these days and you'll see decorations that have to do with the nativity. I was in Costco just a couple days ago, and it wasn't this set Exactly, but it was something similar, this giant nativity set that you could buy at Costco. Now, it's interesting. You might be thinking, well, is Costco all of a sudden becoming more Christian? Are these secular radio stations having a change of heart? No, probably not. Uh, They recognize there's money to be made at Christmas by selling things related to Jesus. But the reality is, for most people, what this means is that they're going to hear the name of Jesus more than any other time of year. And as people hear about Jesus at Christmas time, we see a range of responses to hearing about him. For some people, I'm sure, when they hear about Jesus or they see things like the Nativity, there's just a lot of confusion. 
I don't think that's me. I think that's another mic. There's a lot of confusion. They, they see the, the, the nativity. They see the baby in the manger, and they, they kind of wonder, what is this all about? I mean, what kind of story is there where there's a baby in a manger with animals around and, and shepherds? What's going on here? Now, they, they hear the Christmas carols, and they, they kind of see some of the imagery, but they don't really know what's, what the real story actually is. They're just confused. They don't actually know the story of Christmas. And then you have the next group. The next group are people who know the story, but they only know enough of the story for it not to feel very significant to them. Right? They know that Jesus was born, that he was placed in a manger. They know that there was no room in the inn, that the shepherds and the wise men came. But they don't think of it as a story that's very important to their actual lives. They think of it as something that's nice and kind of cute and sentimental, something nice to think about during the Christmas season. You know, they might even come to a, a Christmas Eve service and kind of enjoy the music and enjoy the nice story. But Jesus doesn't ever become someone that they think they need to make a decision about. When they think of the Jesus of Christmas, they think of a Jesus who's, again, cute and sentimental. Someone you can kind of look at and say, oh, isn't that nice? And then just move on with your life. They, they know the story but they don't think it to be significant enough to actually change anything about the way they live their lives or the way they make their decisions. And then you have the next groups, and these next groups are groups that take Jesus seriously. And the first of these groups takes Jesus seriously, though, in a negative way. These are the people that if you say to them, Merry Christmas, they'll say, how dare you enforce your Christian beliefs on me? Right? These are the people that get offended when Jesus is mentioned and they want to take Jesus out of Christmas. They want to, you know, don't call it a Christmas tree, call it a holiday tree. Don't call it a Christmas party, let's just call it a winter festival or something like that. These are people that know the story of Jesus, they understand that it's significant, but they've decided we want to reject this narrative. We want to reject Jesus. And then, of course, there's those who recognize the story. They know the significance of the story. And they actually embrace Jesus and want to worship him and devote their lives to him. And of course, hopefully in this room, that would be many of us here today. And so at Christmas, you see this range of responses to Jesus as people hear him mentioned. And the connection to our text today is in Mark chapter 3, probably more than any other chapter in Mark's gospel, we see people responding to Jesus in a variety of different ways. You get the full spectrum in Mark chapter 3. And, and while it's true that in all the chapters of the gospel, people are meeting Jesus and responding to him, in Mark chapter 3, you have everybody coming to Jesus. It seems like everybody that you can imagine is taking place in Mark chapter 3, and they're all having different responses. So you have the crowds that so often come to Jesus. They're in Mark chapter 3. You have the 12 disciples, and they're in Mark chapter 3. You have the religious leaders who we've seen time and time again. They're in Mark chapter 3. You have Jesus' family and friends that are coming from, from his hometown. They're in Mark chapter 3. And finally, you have all the other followers of Jesus. And with each of these groups, you see a distinct response to the message of Jesus and to the person of Jesus. Now, as we're talking about all these different responses to Jesus, you might be thinking, well, isn't there a parable that talks about people responding to Jesus in different ways? Didn't Jesus tell a parable about a sower who went out and sowed seed in different soils, and some seed fell on the good soil, some seed fell on the bad soil, and, and the rocky soil, and the weedy soil? And the answer is yes, of course, it's a parable of the sower. Jesus talks about the different responses to his ministry that, that, that happen in, in the lives of people. And what's interesting is in Mark's gospel, Jesus tells that parable in Mark chapter 4 right at the beginning, right after the text that we're looking at today. And so you have this neat dynamic where Mark chapter 3 talks about different responses to Jesus. Mark chapter 4, Jesus tells the parable of the sower and talks about those different responses. And so if you want to say it like this, I think it's helpful. Mark chapter 3 in some ways is like a real life version of the parable of the sower. We're actually seeing what does the good soil look like in real life? What does the rocky soil look like in real life? What does the weeds look like in real life? And as you read through, you kind of keep your eyes open for, and your ears open for, what kind of soil are we witnessing here? And so as we read, I just encourage us to, to be keeping that question in our mind. What kind of response is this to Jesus? What kind of soil might this represent? 
So let's dive into our text now. Mark chapter 3, starting in verse 7. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed. From Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea, and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many so that they all, all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. All of this is probably familiar at this point because we've seen this type of thing already in the gospel. We have on the one hand official opposition to Jesus from the religious leaders and in the verse just before this we read that they want to put Jesus to death and yet Jesus is still massively popular with the crowds. All these activities we've read about before, the crowds gathering to Jesus, Jesus healing the crowds, Jesus casting out demons, Jesus teaching, the crowds flock to Jesus because of the things that he does. Now it's interesting, Jesus tells his disciples, get a boat and, and we'll get in the boat and push out to sea a little bit. There's kind of two purposes for this. One is that it just gives Jesus a chance to be away from the crowds away so that they're not pressing up against him. But also there's this natural acoustic microphone that happens when you speak across water like this. It's really kind of remarkable. And so not only is Jesus able to get away from the crowds that are pressing against him, because he's now in the boat speaking against the water, they can actually all hear what he has to say to them. There's this massive popularity that Jesus has among the crowds. Now at this point, if we were to describe the crowds and ask what kind of soil do they represent in Jesus' parable, we might just be, be able to say, well, don't they represent the good soil? Right? These are people who are enthusiastic. These are people that are excited about Jesus' ministry. They're amazed at what Jesus is doing. But as you continue to read, it becomes clear that the excitement that the crowds have for Jesus doesn't actually last. And because of this, I think the crowds actually are a good representation of what Jesus calls the rocky ground. Listen to what he says about them in Mark chapter 4, verse 16 to 17. These are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. When you see the crowds in the gospel, it becomes clear quite quickly that they're following Jesus because of the things that Jesus can do for them. Right? They find out, what, there's someone who can heal? We're going to see Jesus. There's someone who can cast out demons, we're going to see Jesus. There's someone who's a famous teacher who's in our area, we're going to see Jesus. It says in the text, when the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. They come to Jesus for the things that he can do for them, but the problem is when Jesus stops doing the things for them that they want him to do, they fall away just as quickly as they come. And we see this, this falling away happens when all of a sudden following Jesus is no longer just healing in, in good times and great teaching, but it's actually now persecution and hardship. The crowds that were so excited now just kind of fade to the background and said, this isn't what we signed up for. And I have to say, there's, there's a temptation I think we face sometimes when sharing the gospel with people to make the gospel only something that's, that's positive. And of course the gospel is positive, but what I mean by that is sometimes we have this temptation to not want to talk about anything to do with the cost of discipleship, not want to talk about anything to do with suffering for the sake of Jesus, not want to talk about anything to do with kind of perseverance and endurance in hard times. We kind of want people to have just a, 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 a good picture of, of what it means to follow Jesus, an optimistic future. And so we say things like, you know, God loves you, has a great plan for your life, Jesus is going to change you from the inside out, and your life is going to be full of joy and peace. And those are all true things, but it doesn't give someone the full picture. Jesus says things like, come follow me, take up your cross and follow me. He says, deny yourself, lay down your life. The Apostle Paul says, if we want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, there will be suffering associated with that. 
And again, I think sometimes where we mean well, we want people to follow Jesus. We don't want to kind of distract them or, or maybe scare them off by saying that there's going to be difficulty associated with it. But what happens sometimes is when we don't tell people about those aspects of following Jesus, when they experience hardship or persecution or difficulties, they don't know what to do with those things. They say, well, this isn't what I signed up for. You told me if I followed Jesus, he would make my life great. Now I'm suffering. What's, what's going on with this Jesus that you said would make things so awesome for me? I think we can take good, good courage from the fact that Jesus himself never shied away from talking about the cost of discipleship. Jesus just straight up told people, this is what it's going to take to follow me. These are the hardships you're going to endure. This is the things you're going to suffer. But in the end, it's going to be worth it because following me is greater than anything else you could ever do. I think we need to give people the full story so that they don't have that immediate joy that gives way to a walking away when things get tough. You see, the crowds are interesting because they have great joy to begin with, but then fall away. And I think it reminds us that the beginning of someone's journey with Jesus, their initial reaction to Jesus doesn't always match what happens in the end. We'll see that in this next group as well. We'll keep reading in Mark 3, verse 13 to 19. Jesus went up on the mountainside and called to him those he wanted. And they came to him. He appointed twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. I just got to say, what a group of people that this is. You probably have some friends, and I imagine this would be the case, it is for me, you probably have some friends that you know Hanging out with either of them individually is going to be a good time. You enjoy spending time with this friend. You enjoy spending time with that friend. But you kind of know that if you ever brought those two friends together and hung out with the three of you, it probably wouldn't go very well. Right? You, you probably have friends that, you know, maybe what, this friend is on the really conservative side of the spectrum. They're really vocal about their opinions. And this friend is more on the liberal side of things and very vocal about their opinions. You know, maybe this friend over here loves to hunt and they love to kind of be in the outdoors and, and this friend is a vegetarian and, and against any of that stuff. Right? Maybe this friend has strong opinions about COVID-19 and this friend also has strong opinions about COVID-19. And, and you know that if you were ever to bring these people together, it would probably become pretty tense and pretty uncomfortable. Sometimes I like to think of the 12 disciples as if you took all your friends that you were kind of worried that they wouldn't get along and you said, okay, now you're going to spend three years together and just try to, try to work together and get along. Because you have such a diversity within this group. You have, on the one hand, your four average fishermen. And these four guys that are blue collar, they're working hard, they got their own business, they're trying to make a living fishing on the Sea of Galilee. And then you have a guy like Levi, or as he's called, Matthew, who's a tax collector who would have been probably pretty wealthy, one of the more elite in society. But also you have the fact with Matthew that he was a person who got rich by taxing his own people to support the Roman government. So he would have been someone hated by most of the Jews, but also especially hated by people like Simon the Zealot that we read about. Now, the Zealots were a group that kind of organized in the, in the 70s AD, and they were fighting against the Roman. They were Jewish patriots who fought against the Romans during the uprising. And Simon, it says, was a zealot, probably not a soldier, but someone who had that same religious zeal and hatred towards the Romans. So you can imagine what that would be like where you have Matthew, the tax collector, who's supporting the Roman government by stealing from his own people. And then you have Simon the Zealot, who is just zealously and religiously opposed and hating the Romans. And Jesus calls them both to be his disciples. You have on the one hand Peter, who's loud and says things that come to his mind. If he has a thought, he's going to share it. You have James and John who also in some ways have the same tendency where they tell Jesus, Jesus, we want you to let us sit at your right and your left hand when you enter into glory. And then you have other disciples that you barely hear anything from. We actually don't know much about them because they're not talking all the time, they're listening more. 
And they're, they're trying to take everything in, and we just kind of, they kind of fade to the background. You have Thomas, who's known as a doubter. You have Judas Iscariot, of course, who betrays Jesus. You have this diverse group of people. And so the question is, if you were to kind of label these 12 disciples as a type of soil, and we can maybe bracket out Judas and say, let's, let's not maybe include him right now. But if you had the rest of the 11 and you had to label them as a soil, which soil would the disciples represent? This is a tricky question. Because I think part of us probably wants to say the good soil because, well, these are the, you know, these are the disciples. These are supposed to be the good guys. But we probably would recognize at this point they don't, ascent, they don't exactly match the description that Jesus has given of the good soil. I'll remind us of what that is. In Mark 4, verse 20, Jesus says, Others like seed sown on good soil hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 60, or some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Now, I think we could say that eventually, in the early church, in the book of Acts, the disciples will get to a place where they actually match that description where they're enduring in faithful discipleship, where they're bearing fruit and they're producing a crop. But at this point, I'm not sure they fit that description yet. And so I think if we were to label the disciples, maybe we should say the disciples are good soil in the making. They're on the process to becoming that good soil. Because when you look at them, they're not pictured as just these perfect individuals who are just the epitome of everything good. The disciples have failures all along the way. There's times when Jesus is explaining things to his disciples. He says, I'm taking you aside to explain these things so you understand. And the disciples say, Jesus, we still don't understand what you're talking about. Jesus tells his disciples, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to lay down my life and I'm going to rise again from the dead. And Peter takes Jesus aside and says, Jesus, this is never going to happen. Peter doesn't understand the things of God. In Jesus' great moment of need, all the disciples abandon him. Other other places are called hard-hearted. So we look at the disciples and we say, eventually they're going to become this this good soil that's producing fruit and faithful in discipleship, but they've got a ways to go before they get there. We can use the analogy and say there's still some weeds that need to be pulled out of their their soil. There's still some rocks that need to be dug up. There's still some soil that needs to be cultivated. And I think in, in this way, the disciples are a good example for us. Uh, Not an example in the sense that we should do everything that they did and try to be just like them, but an example in the sense of they represent, I think, for most of us, what our journeys of faith look like. For most of us, it's not, you know, we're doing really bad and then conversion happens and now we're perfect. For most of us, it's conversion happens and we're on a journey where we're constantly working on things and trying to grow in faithfulness, grow in obedience, grow in trust in God, and it's a journey and a path of discipleship that we're on. And the disciples, I think, are a good reminder that even though they have initial failures, even though they have initial doubts, even though they have initial failings, that they continue on that path, they continue to endure, and eventually they get to a place where they're bearing fruit and following Jesus with all all that they have. You see, I think one of the things we continue to see with the soils and with these stories is a person's initial response to Jesus is one thing. But what really matters is that continued endurance in the faith. For the crowds, there was that initial excitement and that initial joy, but it it faded away. For the disciples, it's kind of the opposite. For the disciples, they didn't start out so well, but they continued and they persevered and they endured. And they grew in their faith over time. We see something similar in the next group. In Mark 3, verse 20 to 21. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Uh, This is an interesting passage. A lot of people look at this little story here and say, this just shows you how historically reliable the Gospels are. And why they say that is because they say, if you're trying to make the Gospels up and you're just kind of inventing stories and you're in the business of just trying to make Jesus sound good or the Christianity sound good, you're probably not going to have a story where Jesus' own family comes and says that he's crazy. 
right? If you're just making stuff up and you're just kind of trying to craft stories to make, you're probably not going to make up a story where Jesus' family comes and says, Jesus, you're crazy, you're coming home with us. But that's exactly what happens here. Jesus' family, and, and there's a bit of a challenge in translating it, whether it's his family or his friends, basically those associated with Jesus before his ministry began, they come to him and say, you're coming home with us. You've, you've just completely lost it, and, and we don't want you to, to embarrass us anymore. Now again, we, we might ask the question, where would we put these, this group in the soils? And again, it's hard because we know that some of his family members will become genuine disciples of him later on. But at this point, at least, I think they actually represent the seed, or the seed that's sown among the thorns. In Mark chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, it says this, Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. See, we know that Jesus' hometown where Jesus went to preach, they heard the message of the kingdom, they heard the message of the gospel. But at this point, it's being choked out for the desire for other things. They desire not to have a bad reputation because of what Jesus is doing. They desire to be thought of well by the religious leaders and authorities. In John's Gospel, we read about some of Jesus' followers actually being kicked out of synagogues, which would mean not only being kicked out of a worship service, but also the whole community surrounding that, that, that community of faith. There would be financial difficulties associated with that. And so at this point, Jesus' family says, we care more about these other things than we care about responding to the message of the gospel. Now, I think for most believers, if we're going to be tempted, it's going to be temptation that comes in this way. Right? For most of us, if someone came up to us and said, deny Jesus, we'd say, absolutely not. We would never fall for a temptation that's so direct and so in our face. But sometimes when we look at our lives and we look at the weeds that can grow up, the, the cares for this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desire for other things, I think those are things that certainly can have an influence on our life as believers. Where we know, okay, Jesus is important and, and he's a huge part of my life, but I just really need to focus all my time, all my t- energy, all my attention in this area right now. You know, I know Jesus is important, but I really got to spend way more time over here because this is so, and we, we just get caught up in all these things that everyone else is getting caught up in, and we don't realize it that it doesn't take very long before we look and sound just like everyone else. The thing about weeds is that you never need to plant weeds. Did you notice that? Every garden that you've ever gardened, it came with its own set of weeds. You didn't need to put them there. You never have to try to think about the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things. Those are things that are just constantly coming up and fighting for our attention. And the thing with weeds as well that I've noticed is that you can pick your garden and get all the weeds gone. And it seems like sometimes you'll go at the very next day and all of a sudden you'll look at the garden and say, how did all these weeds get back here? I just got rid of them. There's this kind of incessant desire, this incessant kind of way in which these weeds keep coming up and keep creeping into our lives. I think especially at a time like this, when we're in the middle of Christmas season, it's just another reminder of how often we can get caught up in all these things that don't really matter and miss the thing that matters the most. For Jesus' family, when they first heard the gospel message, they they couldn't receive it because they cared about other things more than they cared about responding. But I think for all of us as believers, is this really, you know, we need to just keep in mind that it's easy for us to get caught up in these things as well. You'll notice that there's a theme in the different soils and the different seeds that are sown. There's, there's a difference in how long that seed lasts. Right? With a good soil, it's planted, it germinates, it grows and becomes a crop and it's, it lasts for the whole for the whole time. But with the weeds, it doesn't last that long. With the weeds, though, it it gets planted, it germinates, it grows, and it kind of is in competition, but eventually it gets choked out. With the rocky ground, it lasts even less. With the rocky ground, it gets gets planted, it germinates, it grows up quickly, and it dies just as quickly. This next group that we're going to read about, the seed doesn't even reach the level of germination. 
We'll read now in Mark chapter 3, verses 22 to 27. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebul. By the prince of demons he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. The teachers of the law come down from Jerusalem and say, Jesus is casting out demons by the prince of demons. In other words, they're saying he's only doing it by Satan's power. It's a very strong accusation, but we shouldn't be surprised because this is the same kind of people that have just plotted to put Jesus to death. These are the people that Jesus talks about in Mark 4, verse 15. It says, Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. See, every other group so far, there's been an initial positive reaction to Jesus. Right? Whether it's the excitement of the crowds, whether it's, it's the, you know, the person who accepts the word, but then the weeds choke it out. There's that initial acceptance of the word, but for the seed so along the path, there's not even that initial acceptance. These are the people that they hear the word of the gospel, they hear the message of the kingdom, and, and there's nothing that penetrates into the hearts. It just hits the ears and falls, falls flat. This is the group represented by the teachers of the law, the religious leaders. They hear the message and, and nothing about it compels them to believe. They look at Jesus and they say, we, we reject you, we reject your message, we don't believe a word you have to say. And yet they, they run into a challenge because there's a problem. And the problem is that Jesus is doing things that they just can't deny. Right? Notice that they don't say, well, Jesus isn't doing miracles. They say, well, Jesus is obviously doing miracles, but we don't believe his message, so we need to find another way to explain what he's doing. And so they say, Jesus is doing these miracles by the power of Satan. He's casting out demons by the power of Satan. And the logic here is this. They're, they're saying, well, Satan is in charge of the demonic realm. Jesus is casting out demons. So therefore, Satan is probably letting him do this because Satan has authority over this realm. It doesn't really make any sense. And Jesus points out the foolishness of it. Jesus says, any kingdom or any house that's divided against itself is going to fall apart right away. He says, Satan wouldn't be so foolish to go against his own. Now, here's an important thing to say. Satan's kingdom, of course, will fall. Jesus isn't denying that, but he's saying it's not going to be an inside job. Jesus says when Satan is destroyed, it's not going to be him destroying himself. It's going to be God decisively acting to destroy the power of Satan. And Jesus says, that's what I'm doing. I'm not casting out demons because I'm in league with Satan. I'm casting out demons because I've conquered him. He uses the analogy of a house. and He says, if a strong man is guarding his house, you can't steal his goods. Right? If there's a person in a house who's stronger than you and, and you want to go rob that person, you're not going to be able to do it. But Jesus says, if a strong man's guarding his house and someone comes in who's stronger than him, who overpowers him, that person can plunder the house and do whatever they want. And Jesus says, that's what's happening right now in my ministry. I'm stronger than Satan. I've tied him up and now I'm doing whatever I want with his house. It's through God's power that I'm casting out demons, not any other power. And yet the teachers of the law, they want to say that the work of God is actually the work of the devil. And Jesus tells them they're going down a very dangerous path when they do that. He gives them a warning in Mark chapter 3, verse 28 to 30. Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. This is a text that's become very famous for being a text about the unforgivable sin, the unpardonable sin. And the question that many people have asked is, what does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? 
Well, in this context, it says they were saying that because he had, or Jesus said this because they were saying that he had an impure spirit. And so what we see from this is blaspheming the Holy Spirit in this context is looking at the clear work of God through the Holy Spirit and attributing it to Satan. Looking at Jesus casting out demons by the power of the Holy Spirit and saying, this is the work of the devil. Now the question is, well, why would this sin be unforgivable? Why would this sin be one that cannot be forgiven? And I think the reason for this is, and and different commentators say different things, but one said, their hearts had become so hard, they would never think to repent. See, the Holy Spirit is the, is the one that convicts us of sin. The Holy Spirit is the one that calls us to repentance. And if we reject totally the work of the Holy Spirit, we no longer have that hope for repentance, which brings about forgiveness. Another way I've heard it said, and I think it's helpful, is this. Once you look at God's great work of redemption, once you work, look at God's great act of rescue on your behalf, and you call it the work of the devil, what hope remains for salvation after that? See, these are people whose hearts are so hard they would never think to repent. They would never embrace the Spirit's prompting to repent, but they've completely hardened their hearts against Jesus. This is not something you do accidentally. This is a willful defiance against Jesus. Now, there's obviously been many Christians who have maybe laid awake at night wondering, have I committed this unpardonable sin? Have I done something to, to offend God? And, and they're you know, anxious and they're, they're confessing any sins they can think of to God and they're really worried about this. I, I'd say that, again, this is not a sin you commit by accident. And I think the fact that someone would be worried about committing this sin and just penitent and, and repentant before God demonstrates that they probably haven't committed this sin. Because those who have gone down this path, they're not responsive to the Holy Spirit. They don't, they don't repent. They don't confess. They're just completely hard-hearted. Another commentator says it this way, It is a warning to those who adopt a position of deliberate rejection and antagonism, not an attempt to frighten those of tender conscience. See, they're going down a dark path, and, and the question we maybe want to ask is, well, how far can you go down that path before you hit the point of no return? Like, how far can you go in hardening your heart and rebellion and rejection before you hit that point of no return? And and the answer is, that's probably not the question to be asking. The The scriptures say, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And what we do see in scripture is that anywhere we find genuine repentance in the asking of God for forgiveness, we see people being forgiven. Think of even the Apostle Paul, who during his early life completely rejected Jesus. He said, you know, Jesus isn't who he says he is. And Paul even rounded up Christians to have them put to death. And and Paul has a conversion experience where he recognizes Jesus is who he says he is. And he experiences repentance and he experiences forgiveness. And so I think for all of us, as as we think about this, just recognizing while repentance is still an option for us, while we still feel that call to repentance and to humble ourselves before the Lord, to just listen to His voice and to do that. We can go down a dangerous road where we just continue to ignore that call to repentance, continue to ignore that, that call to, to just turn our lives back to God. Jesus calls us to continually repent as we, as we follow Him. And again, another reminder that initial failures on this path of discipleship don't disqualify us for all times in the future. It's not like you mess up once and you're done. This is, Jesus recognizes that there's going to be failings, there's going to be shortcomings, but he shows solidarity with those who endure in faith over the long haul. We read about this in Mark chapter 3, verse 31 to 35, and this takes us to the end of our text. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? Jesus asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. 
This is, this is a profound statement. I think sometimes we might miss just how profound it is because we sometimes throw around the word brother and sister pretty loosely. Uh, sometimes we say it in a religious context, you know, as Christian brothers and sisters. Sometimes we say brother, though, or sister when we just forget someone's name. Like, hey, how's it going, brother? You know, we, we don't know someone's name, so we throw this in there. This language was not used in that way in the ancient world. All right? And family was so important in the ancient world that it trumped every other commitment for the most part, other than a commitment to God. And so for Jesus to say to his own family, you're not really my brother, brothers and my mother, those who do the will of God, those are my brothers and sisters. It's a profound statement. I'm sure Jesus' biological family would have been very offended by this. But I'm also sure that those who are following Jesus would have just taken this to heart and just thought this was the greatest thing ever that Jesus would relate to them in that way as they sought to follow him. Again, Christmas is a time when, more than any other time, people hear the name of Jesus and they respond to him. And I hope that this Christmas is one where, when we talk about Jesus, when we talk about what Christmas means to us, that we talk about it in a way that people begin to realize that Jesus isn't just some cute baby in a manger who we can just smile at and just feel nice and warm and fuzzy, but that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Jesus is the Lord of the world. Jesus is the one who offers us absolute forgiveness and calls for our total allegiance. And Jesus is someone that everyone must make a decision about. That decision will be the most important decision a person ever makes. My hope is that this Christmas is a time when those who don't know the story of Jesus would come to know the story. When those who know the story would come to see the significance of the story. And those who see the significance would actually come to make a decision to follow and treasure Jesus above all else. Again, I hope that the way we speak and the way we act this Christmas will point people to those realities. And we'd encourage those we come across to say, you need to make a decision about Jesus. Let me tell you about who he is. Let's pray together. So Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would be with us in this season as we celebrate the birth of your Son. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would speak about Jesus this Christmas in a way that makes people realize he's not just a, a sentimental figure in a manger, but he is the Lord of the universe that he is someone worth giving our whole lives to follow. Father, I pray that you'd help us to speak of Jesus in a way that people see just how awesome he is. And Father, I pray that we would just be able to lead people to this place of saying, you need to make a decision about Jesus. And Father, for those of us who have already made that decision, I pray that you'd help us to walk through this season and continue to endure in faith and obedience that we wouldn't become disheartened when things get difficult, that we wouldn't be distracted by all the cares of this life and the, the desires for other things. But that again, you would just help us to walk step by step, year after year, in this path of discipleship you've called us to. Jesus, we thank you that you call us your brothers and sisters as we walk this path. We take great courage in that. We just thank you and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are going to be just...